Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful to be here tonight. We're so thankful to come together as your body to, to worship and glorify your name and to get into your word tonight, specifically focusing on who you are as you, you've revealed yourself to your people, um, your wonderful attributes and uh, all the amazing things that you are. Lord, I pray that you'll guide our time and you'll guide us as we open up your word. I love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, no, no quiz tonight. I'll, I'll go easy on you for tonight. But we, we are going to be looking at the question tonight for week three is, what is God like? So we, we've talked a lot about Revelation and how God reveals himself, and it's up to God to, to reveal himself to us. You all right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but tonight, I want to start with uh, the Article 1 from the Belgic Confession. The Belgic Confession is a, it's a very old uh, Reformed Confession, and it, this it was one that was very simple and uh, very kind of straightforward. So I wanted just to give this as a starting point. And Article 1 says this, We all believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that there is a single and s- simple spiritual being whom we call God, eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, unchangeable, infinite, almighty, completely wise, just, and good, and the overflowing source of all good. And the first point we're going to look at is this idea that God is both incomprehensible and knowable. And it's important for us to to grasp this idea because this is what God says about himself. And so tonight, uh, once we get past this and we look at some specific attributes that God has revealed about himself, recognizing, first of all, that God has an uh, infinite amount of attributes that even we don't even recognize, um, we're going to kind of be humble as we, we look at some of these. And, and as we get to some of them, we're going to say, okay, this is, are some passages. What does this teach us about God? And what are some implications for us as, as followers of God? And so, like I said, uh, the first thing is that God is incomprehensible and knowable. Uh, Let's turn to Psalm 145. What? Oh, yeah. (laughs) We do email our faces. Ignore us. Okay. (laughs) And tonight, hopefully this helps. Instead, I did it backwards. Instead of putting the... The, the thing I'm talking about, and then I'll tell you what the passage is. I put all the passages. So you can kind of skip ahead, and, and maybe that helps us move quicker through some of these. Um, maybe not. <laughs> Psalm 145, verse 3. And it says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. God is so magnificent, so wonderful, so different than us in the sense that we can't know God fully because he's, he's God. He's infinite being. It says his greatness is unsearchable. In fact, one that helps us with this a lot is Isaiah 55. But let's turn, let's turn to Job 26, 14. Job 26. I'm losing things. It's all right. While I'm turning to Job 26, Mike turned to Isaiah 55. Yep, right before Psalms. Because that's what people told me. I don't know. Because <laughs> 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 you'd sound silly if you said, and it says in the book of Job. I know. Right? So, I, don't, I don't know. I, you know what? Probably yeah, actually, sounds... <laughs> probably some pronunciation in Hebrew that helps us. Because usually names are transliteration of names. Um, especially a lot of like names that we have in, in, in the New Testament are transliterations of Hebrew names into Greek into English, and so that's usually where we get that from. Yeah, like like the name Jesus, 
is the name Joshua. They're actually the same name. In, in Hebrew, Joshua is uh, Yeshua. Joshua, you can even kind of sounds like it. And then, but in Greek, it would be Iesu, where we get Jesus, because it looks more like Jesus in Greek. But if you could, you could almost even call Jesus Joshua if you wanted to. Job is the same. Is it? There's no J's in Hebrew, so it's Yob. Yob. Yob, Yob, maybe Ob. No Yob. Yob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Job 26, 14. Behold, these are but the outskirts of his ways, and how small a whisper do we hear of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? God's ways are past our ways, his ways are not our ways. Right? Isaiah 55, Mike, want to read it for us? For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than their ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Right. And these plus a bunch of other verses we could look at these this teaches us that god is ultimately incomprehensible to us and uh, why well because god is infinite and we as his creatures are finite even the word infinite it's what it is it's the word finite with the in to negate that finite we understand something having having an ending but we don't even understand the idea of something not having an ending so the word infinite really is not Finite. That's what the word means. And so, but God is not finite. He does not have an ending. Um, we don't understand this all the way because the effects of sin on the human mind. And we've talked a lot about that. How sin corrupts our minds and our thoughts. Not only that, but why don't we completely understand God? And why won't we ever? Is because God has chosen to not reveal everything about himself to mankind. Right? Deuteronomy 29.29. Um, let me read that to you. Deuteronomy 29, 29. And Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So the secret things belong to God. God is, is infinite. He has knowledge that we can't... It would, your mind would explode. You know what I mean? Like, we just can't hold that in you. Um, but God has revealed to us things that do belong to us, as he just says in Deuteronomy, that we need to take and we need to love and enjoy and cherish. And the implications of this are, are going to be, as we begin this, and we've talked about this in our study of theology in the beginning, is those who seek God to know God more, we need to do so humbly. We always need to have a humble walk in our knowledge of God because God is infinite. And no matter how hard we study, no matter how hard we think we're book smart or whatever, our ultimate goal is to know things about God to enhance our worship and our relationship with God, not to know facts just to know facts. Amen. Right? There you go. (laughs) Because that doesn't lead us anywhere but to pride and and to problems and and fighting and bickering and stuff. So we, we should do so humbly. And another implication of the God's incomprehensibility is it should deepen our worship. You know, when you don't, when we can't comprehend God, it doesn't make me go, oh, it makes me go fall to my knees and say, you know what, I, I worship this God that I can't fully understand because he's, he's bigger than me. And he's, he's beyond me. But, we said at the same time, God is incomprehensible in toto, completely, but he's also knowable. And we have a few verses there. Let's, let's pass these around, shall we? Let's help out this. Michelle, can you go to 2 Peter 1? Candy, do you want to go to Jeremiah 9? Yes, I've already found that one. Okay, good. <laughs> Tony, John 17. And Mike, Philippians 3. So these ones are going to talk about the nobility of God and how you got off you. <laughs> Second Peter. Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that's called us to glory and virtue. Right. So not only does the knowledge the knowledge 
brings grace upon us. It brings virtue upon us. The knowledge of God, and we've talked about this, I think, the first week. Knowing about God changes who we are. And it is through our knowledge of God that it should affect who we are. It affects us in our worship, affects us in our life, and our service, and everything we are. In Jeremiah 9, 23. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glory, 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 glory. okay, thank you, because <laughs> I kept going glorify, no, 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 no. <laughs> but let him that glory, glory in this, that he understand and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Right. Glory in the fact that you know God, not in riches, not in anything else. But that's, that's the most important thing. That's the most riches we could ever desire. That God is knowable. He has revealed himself. And we can know about him as he has revealed himself. In fact, it's so important that, what does John 17, 3 say? Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, to you have sent. Right. Knowing God is salvation. <coughs> right. The fact that God has revealed himself to his people, that is, that is our salvation. I and mean, Jesus says he's praying the high priestly, priestly prayer, that they may know you, and the Christ whom you have sent. This is salvation for us. Philippians 3. But I surely count also all things to be lost, and they count of the excellency of of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, on account of whom I, I have suffered the loss of all, and count them to be filled that I may gain Christ, and that I may be found in him, not having my righteousness, which would be on the principle of the law, but that which is by faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God through faith. Is that the right passage? Philippians 3, 8 and 9. 2, 11. Oh, 11. <laughs> You're not giving me what I need. <laughs> <laughs> to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Yes. If any way I have arrived at the resurrection from among the dead. From among the dead. That's it. Right. Good, good, good. That's it. To know him. That's the part I'm looking for. Right. He says that's his desire. He says even in death, that's what I want. I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know the sufferings in his death. I want to know him. I want to have that upon me so much. So we do have God that is completely and ultimately incomprehensible to us. But because he loves his people, he has revealed himself in such a way that we can understand. He's condescended to our level and he's given to us knowledge about himself that is amazing to us. And it changes who we are in our life. Uh, the second point we look at is the character and nature of God. How God has revealed himself. And, and we have four ways that we're going to look at tonight. Three pretty quickly and then four we're going to spend time on and the four ways are we, we know about God through his actions we know about God through the names he's revealed himself we know about God through the images we have in the Bible and we know about God through his attributes that we see and um, just very briefly with actions what are some actions of God some things that God does or has done that tell us something about him do you think many actions of God part of the sea Parting the sea? Oh, you mean literally. Yeah. I, I was going to say judgment. Judgment, yes. <laughs> judging, I believe that's an action, yes. What does judging teach us about God? That he's serious. He's serious. Right? What are their actions? Right? So specific, those are specific judgments. Specific judgments. Giving commandments. Giving his law. Right? So you could say giving his law, the action of that, what does that teach us about God? I would say provision because like he provides something he provided. He provides for his people. Well, provision. Uh -huh. Oh, you're okay. Something different. Okay, provision. Uh huh. I mean, his word is provision. Yeah. Well, there is. Yes. Was, and also tell me that it likes order and you just can't go randomly doing whatever you want. God is a God of order. Definitely. You can't just make stuff up, right? God says, "Let me tell you what's, what the real stuff is." You can't just make stuff up. No. God, what about God as creator? That's an action. He, he's, he created all things. We could say he created all things and he's in control of all things. Um, he's, he's the redeemer. So not only does he judge, which shows his justice and his holiness, mm -hmm. but he also redeems, which shows his mercy and his, his love and, 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 and his holiness still because he redeems in a holy and just way. 
and, and we're going to see those more in his attributes. What about some, some names of God? And, and we have lots of these, and, and people we go all day out to these too. Yahweh. Uh, what? Abba, Father. Yeah. He wants no names of God. He made yeah, but you probably don't want to know Hebrew, though. <laughs> well, I have some El Shaddai, right? No, I say Yahweh. You know, Yahweh. Uh-huh. Right, so Yahweh would be, uh, that's what the Tetragrammaton is, is I am. So the, the self-existent God, we learn that from, from, from God. The, the, the only true God, the covenant-making God. Um, we, we often see uh, Adonai, Adon, Lord, Master, right? <laughs> What? I said yeah. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Right? So we see that, that God is the, the, the Lord. Lord meaning a master, the one in control. So we learn those from his characters. El Shaddai, like God Almighty, all powerful. Um, we, we learn about a lot about people from, from their names and, and God particularly. And, and all of his different names that he reveals himself. Uh, we, we can learn from parts of that. Images. What are some images of God that we see? I don't understand. Like, is it like a cross? Well, what, what, I'm thinking God. like the Lord is my shepherd, oh. right? So God is shepherd. What does that tell us about God if we say the Lord is my shepherd? What does a shepherd do? Takes care of the flock. Right. He's a sower. Oh, so he's right. a lily yeah. of the valley, a rose. He's a door. Yeah. He's a billion. Yeah. God, there's so many. Things. All these images and pictures that we have there. We have we have so so it even takes something like the Lord is my shepherd. You think what a shepherd does? It takes care of the sheep. Jesus says that the, the hireling leaves when troubles come, but the shepherd that loves the sheep takes care of and gives his life for the sheep. But also, sometimes the shepherd has sheep dogs that have to snip at and keep the sheep in line. Uh, all these different things that come to mind as we, we call God uh, the shepherd. We, we say we call God Father. right? So there's some pictures of, of fatherliness. In that way. God is our, our rock. Our, 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 uh, God is the husband. Right? Christ is the husband coming for his bride, the church. So even these images that we have help us to kind of put things in a certain perspective of, okay, how does God love us? How does God, do, what does he want from us in these things? And we can learn things yes. from God. Also called a redeemer. A redeemer, right? Uh, there is no savior besides God, Isaiah says, right? Good. So, again, those were brief, but I want to spend time in these, in these attributes. And, and throughout... History, what we've done in the church is we've kind of categorized the attributes just to help us grasp and understand these the best we can. And again, in light of incomprehensibility, this is kind of a, a difficult task, but also in light of God's revelation, it is a humbling task and something that we do. And so what we have here, we have some technical terms in there. We have incommunicable attributes and communicable attributes. Um, and basically what that means is incommunicable Attributes are, are attributes of God, distinctive characteristics of God that really we don't understand because we have no parallel in, in, in humanity. Um, communicable attributes, though, even though God is these attributes to the nth degree, to, to, the, to the fullness, to the exhaustion of them all, we still can understand them to a small degree. Like we say, God is love. That's an attribute of God. Well, we understand love to a small degree. Not exhausted, like God understands it, but we understand it to a small degree. So that's just the basic breakdown of the the attributes of God. So, and here's what I want to do. I want to read through these verses and then say, what possibly does this teach us about an attribute of God? First, starting with these incommunicable ones. Acts 17, 24. Does somebody have that already? I don't. Yeah, you want to read it? 24? 25? God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. Right. So God, maker of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands, and he does not need anything for man. Exodus 3.14. Anybody have that one already? You have it? You want to read Texas 314? Okay. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Mm-hmm. I am that I am. We talked about that. God is self sufficient. He is the only one. He is in and of himself there. Uh, He's him Job, else. I got Job 41. Good. 
<laughs> Alright, somebody fight song. <laughs> Job 41, 11. Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. Whoever is given to me, who, who, who has ever given to God that he should repay him? <coughs> That's a rhetorical question. The answer is no one. Does anybody have Psalm 50? Okay. <coughs> I will take no bullocks out of the house, nor he goes out from the fold. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Right. So, Acts 17, God says, I don't dwell in temples made with hands. He says, I don't, I'm not served by man like I need anything from man. Exodus 3.14 just said, I am that I am. I am Yahweh. I'm the self-existent one. Job 41 says, has anybody ever given anything to me that, that I need to repay them? The answer is no. Psalm 50, we just read, everything in the earth is mine. If I'm hungry, I'm not going to ask you. It's not like God's hungry, but he's saying, I don't need to ask you. This teaches us, any ideas? It's okay if we don't know the technical terms, but what are, what, is there any thrusts in these words that we, we see that may be a theme? I, I think that when the Lord tells you that, he's saying that he doesn't need us for anything. Mm -hmm. He provides everything for us, and Amen. we should be worshiping him and glorifying him. <laughs> Self-reliant. Right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it means the same thing. It's all the same thing, right? Well, tech, what... what Theologians call it, and whatever, you know. But we, we call this the independence of God. Oh, good, I was close. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to write that down, I don't know if you want to, but there's a line there that says, the independence of God. These verses teach that, and multiple, multiple verses like it. And the independence of God, uh, a small, easy definition would be this. God does not need us or the rest of creation for anything. Yet we and the rest of creation can glorify him and bring him glory. God did not have to create the world because he was lonely. And as we talk about God being tri triune next week, we'll see God has always been in perfect, holy, loving communion with himself for all eternity. So God doesn't need anything from us. God would still be just if he condemned the whole world in their sin. God would be just to do whatever he wants. God is God. The independence of God teaches us that God does not need anything from us. We need everything from him. So, what are some implications from that? What, what, what hope could that give us? Or what does that help us see God in a, a different light or anything? Like what comes to mind if you hear that? That God is independent. He doesn't need anything from people. We don't got to worry about anybody um, manipulating him, destroying him. Right? <laughs> no. No. Means that no matter what we're doing, he doesn't depend on us. We're depending on what we do for him. So he'll forgive us or not forgive us or how does it work when it says he doesn't depend on us? And yet we're like his work or You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? How does that apply in there? Well, he's, he's sovereign, and we're going to get to sovereignty in a second, too. But he, he, can, he uses us for his glory, whether it's, you know, vessels made for honor or vessels made for destruction. I don't know, I've read enough times. He's doing for us because he loves us, not because he's dependent on whatever we do. I don't know, but, but if he can't find, if we won't do what he asks us to do, he'll find somebody else that will. Mm -hmm. Right. Or so he'll make it do it. Or, <laughs> yeah, he can, and he doesn't depend on us. Uh -huh. But again, when we get, we get to some of these other ones, I can't think of them all, but his, his omnipotence and, and his, his omniscience, he's going to know whether or not you're going to do it, and make you do it if you don't want to rock. I mean, yeah. So. And again, at the end of this, we're going to talk about how, although it's, it's, we want to study them separately to understand parts about God, in reality, at the end of the day, we don't separate any of God's attributes from another. They all are work together in unity. So the implications that, well, one implication that I have here is God never experiences need. So serving God should never be motivated by the thought that he needs us. He's the provider of everything. 
When we serve God, it's because we need to serve Him. It's for our good. It's not for His good. Uh, Malachi 3.6. I'll get Malachi if somebody wants to get Psalm 102. I have Psalm 102. Do you? Let me get Malachi first. They have to go in order. <laughs> Malachi 3.6 says this. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. I, the Lord, do not change. Psalm 102, 25 and 27 to 27. 25, 2 and 27. Uh-huh. Uh, the, of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax Fold like a garment, as a vesture shall thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Right. So the stuff in the world changes, but God never does. <laughs> Everything else it has has no end. Does anybody have James one seventeen? Um, every good and perfect gift is from God, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. All good gifts come from God. He does not change. <coughs> and Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should change his mind. He, he Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Malachi 3, God not change. Psalm 102, things around us change. God does not change. God is not like a shadow. God does not change. God says it, he's going to do it. What is this teaching us about God? Trust you. Believe he's trustworthy. Him. He's what? Believe him. Why? Because he tells you to. All right. But what his character is, right. is he makes us want to believe him from these passages. Everything he says, he does. Everything he says, he does. And he's not going to be this person one day and this another person the next day. You yeah. know, he's going to be... Yeah. Consistent, right? Right. That's right. <laughs> right. Which, like, you, if you if you ever study like the Greek gods, Lard is a thing on the Greek gods in, in school. And, like, that's what the Greek gods were. They were just cranky right. gods that if they were mad, then they would do crazy things. And you always had to keep the gods happy because if they're mad, then oh, if they're having a bad day, you know, that's the whole Greek thing. It's crazy. Um, the technical term we use for, for, for this is we say this teaches us about the immutability of God. That's kind of a weird word, immu- immutability. But basically that means that God is unchanging. And he's unchanging in his being. He's unchanging in his perfection. He's unchanging in his purposes. And he's unchanging in his promises. What God says he's going to do, he's going to do. When God says this is who I am, he's always going to be that way. He is immutable. And uh, an implication this gives us is that we can help. This is, says that God can always be trusted because he always keeps his word and is never capricious or moody, grumpy. He's not a Greek God. He's always who he is. There are some stories of the Greek mythology that believe that when the people stopped believing in the gods, they, they stopped they stopped existing, but the gods themselves stopped existing. There you go. Well, when was the last time you ran into a Zeus worshiper? You know what I mean? Like, it's interesting <laughs> that, you know, that, that when Laura's teaching a lot of this stuff at school, she find, I give her some material and stuff like that to like, compare it. She says she finds it interesting that she's like teaching about um, uh, Artemis. Artemis was a Greek god. Artemis is mentioned in the Bible in Acts chapter 17, I think we that there's a temple to Artemis in Ephesus, and like Paul walks by to the temple in Artemis, and so like there, there's coinciding between this, and there's people worshiping those Greek gods. Well, two thousand years later, nobody worships Artemis. You know, new things will always come along, and they'll disappear with the wind. But the true God of the Bible, He'll always be there. He'll always be consistent. He'll always be true to His word. Psalm. 90. Who wants to find that? And then who wants to find Isaiah 46? 
You gotta call him, guys. We need to call him so we know what we're doing. I can solve 90. Alright, I got it already. I need a John 858. Everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. God has always been God. God will always be God. From the beginning to the end. From the beginning of all eternity. Right? There's no difference. God has not changed. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do. All my pleasure. Right. God sees the end from the beginning. It's no difference to him. When he looks down, he looks in time. God's outside of time. He can see all things at once. John 8, 58. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. This is a great passage. Because this is talking about Jesus is claiming to be God there. He says, I am the eternal God. I am God in the flesh. He says, before Abraham was, first of all, we have two different things. Before Abraham was, I am. Abraham was way back in Genesis. Abraham was way, 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 way born before Jesus was born in the flesh. But Jesus is saying, before Abraham was even born, I already was. And that's a big, crazy thing to people. What are you talking about? You're, you're not even 50 years old. How could you be as old as Abraham? And he says, before Abraham was born, I am. Ego me, I am, which is what we just read in Exodus 3.14, when God says, I am. So he's right there telling us that he, Jesus in the flesh is eternal, and he is the eternal God. Amazing passage. Jude 24.25. Isn't it cool when you turn to Jude, because it's not like chapter, it's just Jude 24. I was finding that interesting, sorry. <laughs> Did anybody find that one? I know. Oh yeah, okay, read it. 24. <laughs> I was going to yell at him. No. Now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. All right. So we have three things there. So there's majesty, glory, whatever he says there. What did he say? There are three things. Before... Say it. Past, present, and future. Right. But what does it say? Oh, before, before, now, and forever. Now and forever. Past, present, and future. So Jesus, the eternal God, God in the flesh, says, I have this glory, this dominion, everything, past, present, and future. What do these verses teach us about God? He is, was, and always will be. Yeah. Pretty much. We, we, call, we, say, we could say this teaches us the eternity of God, or, or the eternality. You want to be a little bit more technical. He the, was before anything else was. Right. God has no beginning or end and is no way bound by time. So there was two particular things in this. Um, that God himself in his being, perfection, everything we said before, has no beginning, no end. And he also is outside of time. He does not live in time the way that we do. Time, in fact, is, is one part of the created order that he's put to place. So, like we read in Isaiah, when he wants to see something, he sees what it's going to be like, what it has been, what it is now, whatever. Although God can work in time, and God does work in time, he is not bound <coughs> by time. What are some implications for us in life to know this? What are some implications in life? So, so how should that change us or, or move us or whatever? Yeah, the, just knowing that God is eternal, knowing that God is outside of time. These, these well, paths. I actually call him sometimes God of time mm -hmm. because he showed me some things that I really, really <coughs> And so now, if, if I'm going someplace and I feel that I'm going to be late or that things aren't working out, right, all I do is say a prayer and thank the Lord and go on about it. Mm -hmm. She didn't pray tonight. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I, know, I didn't either. <laughs> no. God, traffic was amazing. Mm -hmm. I only had to stop on the highway. That was God. 
So, you know. But she gets home so late by the time she gets home at quarter to six. Uh, then we scarf down pizza, which we have every Wednesday night. It's the only quick thing we can yeah. have. <laughs> and then we pick her up and just barely, I don't know, mm -hmm. just time just flies. I made time for us, though. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, but he controls time. Right. Well, that's what I mean, he made it for us, even though he's outside of it. I'd say I mean, definitely it's part of the creative order. It's a blessing for us, yeah, yes, for yes. us to be in time. <laughs> but it's also a blessing to recognize that he's not, yeah. because I don't know what's up there, but he does. Okay. Right? Is there some, are, are, is one of these about him being omnipresent? Uh-huh. Shh. Okay, I'm yeah. just asking. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, this is what I have. I said, those who trust the God of eternity, so the God of time, just like he said, those who trust the God of eternity can know peace, rest, and comfort in the busyness of life in spite of impending death, for God keeps them in safety and joy forever. What about these next three? We got Jeremiah 23. Anyone want to get Jeremiah 23? First Kings... 827. What? Read the verse first. <laughs> <laughs> from me? Am I not there already? Is it, is, do I not fill the heavens? Do I not fill the earth? In fact, does anybody have 1 Kings 8? Yeah. You do? 8.27? Go ahead and read it. This is uh, Solomon's prayer at the temple. But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Yeah. I like that verse. He's got us so immense that he can't contain, and yet and he's, he lives inside of us at the same time. Isn't that cool? Yeah. He's so big and yet he's so everywhere. What is it like when he said the highest heaven? In, in the Jewish culture, this is where Mormonism goes wrong. When it talks about three levels of heaven, it means you have where the birds go, where the birds fly, and then you have the stars are, and then the third level would be where God dwells. So they're essentially talking about the sky and then the Right? The sky, the bird, the sky, outer space, and then the place Seven. where God dwells. I would think that awesome and like the highest, like there's no higher than heavens. Say what? Not mentioned seven times. Have to look into it. <laughs> um, Psalm 139. You got it? Seven to ten. I just stated Psalm. So. <laughs> All right, there you go. Psalm 139. 7 through 10. 7 through 10. Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee free from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost, uttermost parts of the sea, thou art there. I'll I'll say that again. Even there in thy oh, yeah. hand shall. <laughs> Even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Amen. What do these three verses teach us about God? He's everywhere. He's everywhere. There's not a place that God isn't. God is mm -hmm. omnipresent. Uh, this teaches about the omnipresence of God. Mm -hmm. You got something to say about that? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> Two really cool scriptures. Okay. Maybe somebody's never heard them before, and they're really awesome. Okay, cool. 
when from John 6, when he, when he was telling them he had to, they have to eat, eat his flesh and drink his blood, and uh -huh. tripping. Okay, so, and they're offended, right? Yep. And in John 6, um, 62, okay, Jesus says, does this offend you? What, and if you see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? So, I mean, that's mm -hmm. deity, obviously. Mm -hmm. But he's better. Or, I'm sorry, there's one more. No, this is like the best scripture I ever saw. And it was Jesus talking while he's standing on the earth. Where'd you go to? John 3, 13. Because he's standing on the earth and he says this. No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. He said that, standing on the earth. So in his deity, he's still I mean, he like said, him. the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Like he's saying, I'm in heaven, but he's staying on earth. Yeah, he's got everybody in heaven. Well, I thought that was just. That is cool, right? How many presents? <coughs> it's Daniel 7. Go. No, that's what it is. That's a, that's a reference to it. It's Daniel 7. Yeah. yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> he's quoting Daniel 7? <laughs> These are the Son of Man versus Black Times Quote of Daniel. When I saw in my visions, below with the clouds, it came like one of the Son of Man and came to the ancient of the days and was presented before him. And yeah. that's the reference to that scripture passage is coming like the Son of Man. That's uh -huh. kind of the explanation of Daniel 7. And that's, that's cool to always see that when you have. So you, you're right there. That's Trinitarianism right there, too. The, the, the Son of Man coming to the ancient of days. Awesome. Isn't that cool? <laughs> So yeah, that's what I said. In <laughs> your mind explodes. It's, just, it's so cool to see how Scripture works together. Omnipresence in this little, little definition is this. God does not have spatial dimensions and is present everywhere with his whole being, though he acts differently in different situations. So God can be in one place, but he's also in every place at the same time. In 139, we just read it. Where can I hide from you, God? If I go somewhere, you're there. If I go there, you're already there. First Kings, you know, you could be here, but you, you're, even you're so big that you expand the universe. And it's God actually being there. He doesn't have spatial dimensions like people. Um, John 4, right? God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. What are some implications about this for us? Well, like Isaiah 53 says, God looks down from heaven on man. He sees none that is good. So this is all mankind, mm -hmm. which is quite a span. Mm -hmm. It's quite a projection from beginning to end. 